Thank you so much for joining us this morning as we continue in our study in the book of Acts. My name is Steve McKenzie, and I have the joy of uh, serving as the lead pastor here at Cross Point, and so thankful that we get together together this morning to study God's Word. I did want to let you know, if you are visiting with us this morning, I would love to, to get to meet you, and we do have a gift for you, which is this uh, Acts journal. It's the book of Acts in journal form. This is what I've been studying through myself and kind of my notes here scribbled throughout as kind of reading and praying through the passage. We're encouraging as a church family that we would be in God's Word together. And so if you're visiting, we would love to give this to you. If you're a regular and you're like, hey, I kind of like one of those too. It's a suggested donation of $5. If you can't afford that for whatever reason, feel free to take one anyway. Um, we want this to, to be a gift, so we want to really get this in people's hands so we can be studying God's Word together. So let's pray. As we come to God's Word, His authority, we want to submit beneath it to understand what He has to say to us this morning. So let's pray. Lord, I thank You for the joy that it is to gather together Lord, that we are the church throughout the week, and then in this moment, we get together together to sing, to celebrate who you are and what you've done. And, and Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you would give us understanding. I pray that you would give us ears to, to hear and, and eyes to see, and that your word would transform our minds, that it would soften our hearts. Lord, and that you would uh, work within us. And in Jesus' name, amen. So do you remember a few weeks ago when Weatherby Road was going to be closed? Like, and it was on the day that we were supposed to have the potluck and we were doing the, the lunch and, and the vision and, and people are like, oh no, there's this sign that says Weatherby is going to be closed. We need to make sure that everybody hears this so that people don't get lost or else they're going to get to that point, be like, I don't know where to go and just turn around and hit home and then miss out on it. And so there was concern. I had people coming up to me and saying, hey, make sure you announce this from the stage. Let's put this on social media. We don't want anybody to be left out, right? Like this is a good thing. This is a, a good concern. And, and as I was thinking about it and what we're studying here in the book of Acts, it's that same concern and desire that I hope we have for the gospel as well. That same concern we had for the closure of a road and that people might get lost and lose their way and just go back to what they're used to. If we had that same desire, that same passion to make sure people knew and know the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he has done. Do they know? Are they wandering around lost? Do they know the, the way, the truth in the life? This is, is really the purpose and what we've been saying of the book of Acts, because this was God's concern. This is why God said, wait in Jerusalem to the disciples where you will receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and then beyond that in Judea and Samaria and beyond that to the ends of the earth. This is the big idea that the glory of Christ would be known among all peoples through witnesses who are empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the heart that's the movement that God has that all people would know. There's a concern. There's a motivation. And, and that's what we began seeing is in that command that the disciples would wait to receive power. They did. They received power. Peter stood up and preached and it says 3,000 came to Christ. And then last week in Acts chapter 3, we learned how they were going up to the Temple Mount to pray at 3 p.m. And there was a lame man who had been lame from birth that God healed. And then that man began to dance and to celebrate in the temple and a crowd gathered. And once again, Peter stood up and preached the same message. And as we'll learn, 2000 more trusted in Christ. But it's today in Acts chapter four that we see the first opposition to the gospel. It's the first time that as God's goal and desire is to see the proclamation of the gospel to all people, it's met with resistance from some powerful leaders at the time. But we'll see that in response, God emboldens the average disciple, just the average person, 
to proclaim the message of the cross with boldness and to say that Jesus is the only way that we can be saved. This is what we're going to see this morning. So let's, if you'll turn with me, Acts chapter 4, we're going to be looking at the first 22 verses this morning. It says, and as they were speaking, remember Peter and John are on the temple. This man has just been healed. They just proclaimed the truth. Jesus healed them. It's Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. Repent and believe on him. So as they're saying these things, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now on the next day, their rulers and the elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Ananias and the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were in the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power, or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning the good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him... This man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw their boldness, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For for that a noble sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is God's Word. So here's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to simply walk through this passage. There's, there's six observations that I want us to see in this passage this morning. And, and in each of these observations, I want us to understand the historical context. Because a lot of times, I don't know if you've ever heard people, they read God's Word and they're like, well, to me it means something. And then someone else will say, well, to me it means this. I'm a firm believer that that these are real events, real people. It happened in a historical, cultural context that as we understand that, what the original context meant, that'll help us accurately apply that today. And so in each of these observations, I want us to help us see this historical context so that then we can, for each of these observations, apply them today. What does this mean for us? In light of what God's Word says, How then should we respond? How should we apply this? How should we understand what God's Word is saying? So let's jump in at the beginning. The first observation is this, that we know to some degree what we're up against. 
Like this is the first opportunity that we're going to see opposition to the gospel. But there's some root motivations behind this that are the same. It doesn't matter time or culture or context, but I want us to see it from the original here. Notice who the players are. The priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees. Now some may be like, okay, I've heard the word Sadducee before, but what does that mean? Like, who are they? If you haven't grown up in church, you're going to be like, I have no idea who these people are or why I should care. The Sadducees were were really the the religious aristocrats. Like, this includes the high priest, the, the family. Like, they had some of the the greatest power in Jerusalem and over the people in Israel at this time because they were in charge of guarding the Holy of Holies. Like this is where the presence of God dwelt and they were responsible for guarding that, of standing between the nation and the presence of God. They also oversaw the sacrificial system. This was the way that people had fellowship with God was through sacrifices, and these people controlled that. This was their livelihood. This was their place. And because of this, it gave them great power religiously, economically, um, politically. Rome had occupied Israel at this time, and so the Roman governor would often deal with this political realm of the Sadducees. This is who they would interact with. It was also that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. See, the resurrection was considered this radical doctrine, this radical idea, like keep people under control because if people think that there's something better down the road, it'll make them not care as much for what it means now, today. Like, I have hope in what the future holds. And so the Sadducees denied the resurrection. You can remember this. I had a pastor who would sing this kid's song, and I'm not going to sing it. Some of you might know it. um, And if some of you do know this, you can help others. But you can remember that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection because they're sad, you see. Uh, But it does help me remember it. As goofy as it is, it does help. And the Pharisees were fair, you see. And, and, and that was a way like that the Sadducees had did not believe in the resurrection. The, the, and so they resisted the teachings of Jesus for political reasons, because of power and authority. Like, we're going to see how that annoyed them. It just bothered them. It just got under their skin. They were so annoyed by this, where Pharisees rejected Jesus because of religious reasons, the Sadducees rejected him because of political reasons. And it says that they were greatly annoyed. Just annoyed. I love that phrase, right? Not just mad, not upset, not nothing righteous here. They're just annoyed. And it actually tells us why. For one, because they're teaching. Like, who gives you the right to talk to our people? We're in control here. Sit down, be quiet. We're the ones who teach and lead. We're the ones who have authority. Who gave you the right to stand up and teach these people on the Temple Mount? And so they were annoyed that Peter and John would even have the audacity to stand up and teach. And then they were even more annoyed because they're proclaiming the resurrection in Jesus. Like, we don't agree with this. You can't tell people that. That just messes everything up. I mean, you have to imagine that the Sadducees are the ones in power, right? And now you're saying that the Spirit of God, as we learned last week, is no longer present in the Holy of Holies. When Jesus died on the cross, the the curtain was torn. Now the, the presence of God is not in one place where you get to guard it, but God has freely, freely placed His Spirit in each and every believer. That the sacrifices that that you guard, that you get to control, aren't needed anymore. Because Jesus was the final sacrifice. And that when you place your faith in Him, you will rise from the dead because He rose from the dead. This blew up their whole world. Every bit of power, every bit of authority is being undermined here 
And they are greatly annoyed by this. And then, to make matters worse, another 2,000 men. Who knows that the, the total number of families and women and children believe on Jesus? So they're like, now these men have stood up on our temple mount, believe these men who have no authority, and believing something we didn't give them permission to believe. So they arrested him. I think it does help us as we understand what's happening here. What does this mean today? And I think it does take some some thought, and even more so than we have time here for, and I'm encouraging it in the community groups of what leaders, positions of power, authority are challenged by the message of the gospel today. Like, I think for some that can happen inside the church and outside the church, to be honest. My wife is currently teaching a a church history at a homeschool co-op, and so we've been talking a lot of church history in our home. And, And it used to be that the church said, you cannot be saved apart from the church. Like, oh, you want to have eternal life, you have to come through us. Do you see the problem there? Like, what are, are we seeing here in the text? That Jesus is the one who saves. The church doesn't save. The church is a gathering of believers who live life together every day of the week together. We don't get to hand out forgiveness or hold it back from you. That belongs to Christ in Christ alone. Jesus is the one who saves. One commentary that I read um, that was in, it's called Exalting Jesus in Acts. He said this, Likewise, in our preaching and teaching, we dare not commend a set of moral rules to make people more acceptable before God, but rather we should commend the risen Lord Jesus Christ who alone makes us acceptable. He is the hero of the whole Bible and is the one to whom the whole Bible testifies. He is our message. He is our theme. So we may say with Paul, we proclaim Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. This is what we proclaim. This is our hope. It's in Christ it's not in me. It's not, belo- it's not because you belong to a particular church. It's because of Christ and Christ alone and what He has done. But I think that this truth also challenges not just inside the church, but outside the church when we consider the general thought of moralism. Right? Just be a good person. But who gets to define that? Who then has the power and authority? We do. Well, if I get to determine what's good and what's bad, I'm good enough, right? I mean, the simple logic of it works like that. Like moralism can just say, well, if I'm a good person, then everything's okay. But Jesus wrecks all that. He says it's not a matter of what you call right or wrong, that we have sinned. Christ is holy. He had to die for our sins. And so it undermines our own desire, not just someone else's desire to try to have power and authority over us, but our own desire for power and authority over our own lives that we have to submit to, that we have to say, no, I'm not good enough. I haven't done enough. Christ is enough. He has paid the price. The second observation is this, that difficulties are opportunities for Christ to shine. Look with me when it says that in verse 3, so the leaders are annoyed. Stay out of my playground. This is my thing, not God's. And they arrested them and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. They made them sleep there overnight and then they put them on trial. Bring them before the whole family. Now are they going to question them. By what power have you done this? And whose name? Now think with me for a moment. God has said to them, wait in Jerusalem where you'll receive power and then you'll be witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, 
ends of the earth. They're like a week or so into this, and they're in jail. Okay? Before the same high priest before whom Jesus stood and was crucified. So at a certain point, you're kind of like, that's not how I thought this was going to go. Right? Like, I kind of thought that we were going to start here and then move on, but here we are in jail. And it's at times like this that I think Christians can often have a hard time and it can lead to confusion. Like, okay, God, I'm doing what you said. Why am I here? Why is this happening? You said that this, this, and this was going to happen, but I obeyed, and now I'm spending the night in jail? What does that mean? Like, we use phrases. We, we like these phrases as Christians. Like, is the door open or closed? Oh, the safest place is in the center of God's will. We like these sort of statements. But listen to these verses. This first one's from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It says, as Christians, we are called to suffer. Jesus left us an example that we might follow in his steps. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. The church is told to don't be unaware, don't be caught off guard Following Christ means, and it meant for the Apostle Paul being burdened beyond his personal strength where the Apostle Paul felt like he was going to die. And this is walking in obedience. And then it's like, why? Why would God allow this? Like, have you ever found yourself saying that? God, I'm trying to do the right thing here. Why is this so hard? Why am I having to experience so much hardship, so much suffering? And it feels like this shouldn't be normal. It is at times in our American thinking, but in reality, the scripture says, yep, we're kind of told that's how it's going to be. We shouldn't be shocked. We shouldn't be caught off guard. But why? Why would God allow this? And in that 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul answers this question. And he said, but God allowed this to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And on Him we have set our hope. The reality is God does allow and use intentionally suffering, hardships, difficulties, to help us know Him better and to shine through to glorify Christ. And so how do you pray when life gets hard? Like maybe you're going through a difficulty now, a hardship, and you're kind of like, God, I'm trying to follow You, but how did I end up here in this situation? How do you pray? Do you just pray that God would take it away? Make, make my path easy, God. Take away the suffering. Take away these difficulties. And I'm not saying it's bad to pray that way, but if we only pray that way, shouldn't we also pray, Lord, help your strength be sufficient for me. Help me rely on your strength in this. Shine through this difficulty. I feel like I'm being crushed to the point of death. But God, my hope is in You. Shine through. Don't just ask that God would take it away. Ask that God would give you the strength to endure because He's sufficient. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that the best place God wants me personally is in this place of a, what I'm calling like a holy inadequacy. Like I feel the weight of this. As a father, as a husband, as a pastor, that the things I long for in my family, the things I long for in this church, I can't do. I can't manufacture. God has to be the one to do that. And it's not about, Lord, help me be able to do this. It's, Lord, do this through me. Help me rely on You. Let Your strength be sufficient. Don't let me find my sufficiency in myself. Help me know You more through this difficulty, through this challenge. 
And that's what we see here. And then we see that the Holy Spirit, this is point number three, the Holy Spirit gives boldness to proclaim the Gospel. Look at what it says in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and then he's going to go on to preach, which we're going to look at. Now here's the thing to remember. This is the same Peter who stood outside this house. Caiaphas was, he was in the courtyard of Caiaphas when Jesus was under trial, when the young girl came up to Peter while he's sitting around a fire and saying, aren't you one of the disciples? Uh-uh, not me. Now Peter is before the high priest, before the family, before the, this high priestly family, before all the leaders and is being questioned. And he's speaking with boldness. And it says that he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this should raise a question because it's like, doesn't he already have the Holy Spirit? Like it said earlier on that the Holy Spirit is indwelling the believer. That these are the same verses. That at the moment of belief, the Holy Spirit lives inside each and every believer. And I think what we see here is an example of what it means then to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not like this silent partner that you're just carrying around with you. Right? Right? The, the Holy Spirit is always present inside at all times, every believer from the moment of salvation. And then He works through us. Like He's giving boldness. He's giving the right words at the right time for Peter in this moment to speak, to proclaim the Gospel. This is, is what it's saying here, that the Holy Spirit gives the boldness to proclaim. Have you ever experienced this in your own life? Like you're in the middle of a conversation, you're like, I don't know how to respond to this question in this conversation. And you feel like God gives you the right words, the right situation of how to respond this is, is what that's like. This is the Holy Spirit working through that we don't have to worry about what we're going to say in that moment because the Holy Spirit is with us and will give us the right words to respond. That it's a reality that the same Spirit that is inside Peter in this passage is inside you if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Like, think about that. The same Holy Spirit that gave Peter the boldness to proclaim when it could have felt like his life is on the line. It gave him the boldness to proclaim. I mean, have you ever found yourself on the edge of like one of these hard conversations? Right? And you're like, I really don't want to say anything. I don't know where I'm going to begin. I don't know what I'm going to say. And, and the thoughts are swirling in your mind. And, and then you take the first step and you say that first word. Like, okay, we need to talk. And then we trust that God is going to give the words. That I believe in the same way that the religious leaders at the time wanted to threaten Peter and John to not speak, to allow fear, to cause them to remain silent. We need to respond with faith that God will give us the words we need when we need it. Not to make excuses, not to respond in fear and remain silent. But when God opens the door, and I'm not just talking about it in evangelism or sharing the gospel, though yes, that's true, but what about with one another? In one another's life, as we spur one another on to become more and more like Christ, are we willing to trust in God to give us the words in those moments? To speak truth into one another's life to pursue Christ together? Or is it just easier to just remain silent? To say, ah, it's not my problem. We need to respond with faith. Number four, it says Jesus is the sufficient cornerstone and He's the stumbling block. 
as Peter begins preaching, you'll notice that his message is pretty much exactly the same as what it's been. Right? He says, okay, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what means it's been done, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel by, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. It's kind of bold. Remember who he's talking to. What happened to Jesus when he stood before them. It was in the name of Jesus whom you crucified, who then God raised from the dead, and by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Now, here's the amazing thing. This is when I love studying the Bible. Because I read that, and I'm like, okay, like, he, he quoted from Psalm 118 that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's a stumbling block to, to others. There's nothing that immediately stood out to me in this. And then I remembered in Luke 20, there's a similar story. And this is where you really see the boldness of Peter and what he's saying. Because see, in Luke 20, Jesus was teaching, and it says he was preaching the gospel on the Temple Mount. And guess what happened? These same leaders weren't happy. And they're like, by what authority are you teaching up here on the Temple Mount? Sound familiar? And Jesus then responded with a question. And it was a question that they were unable to answer because they don't like taking sides and having people not like them. And so then Jesus is like, fine, then I'm not going to answer your question. But let me tell you a story. And so then Jesus responds with a parable. And it's a parable of this man who owned a vineyard. And he was going to leave the country, and so he left that vineyard to some tenants to take care of his vineyard. And over time, the, the owner of the vineyard sent servants to go to the vineyard and to collect some of the fruit from its harvest to bring back. But when the tenants saw these servants, they beat them and sent them back empty-handed. So the man who owned the vineyard sent another servant to go and to get some fruit. And they beat him and sent him back empty-handed. And then it happened again. So finally, the man who owned the vineyard sent his son. And then the tenant said, oh, if we kill the son, then we'll get his inheritance. And so they killed the son. And then Jesus asked the question. He says, what will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants? And he said, he will destroy them and he'll give the vineyard to others. Now, the religious leaders are starting to catch on at this point, like, uh, Jesus is talking about us here. Like, mm, surely not, they said. Hey, God wouldn't do that. Like, don't go so far in this parable, please. And Jesus, it says, looked directly at them and said, it is written, the stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And Jesus then added, and everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. So are you tracking with me? So now Peter and John are standing here. And Peter is saying, you crucified him. And this Jesus is that stone. The same one who stood on the Temple Mount before. He's the stone that will crush you. He's the one you're stumbling over. And he just lays it out on them. And then in verse 12, he says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That is a powerful statement. Especially in our time, in our culture when we think of the resistance that happens, if we say there is salvation in Jesus, that He is a way, people aren't necessarily going to have an issue with that. You do you. I'll do me. But when you say that Jesus is the way, the only way, now we have an issue. See, as long as you say that, yes, you can follow Jesus and you can follow Muhammad and you can follow humanism and you can follow one of the however many Hindu gods there are, like as long as you say it's all okay, we're fine. 
But don't dare say Jesus is the only way. And I want to be clear what it says here. There is no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is only in the name of Jesus. This Jesus of Nazareth, it's specific. It is not just this general image of Jesus that is built up in culture or in other false religious texts. It is Jesus from God's Word. This Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, in whom we place our faith and trust because God raised Him from the dead. It's in this Jesus that we have salvation. And some in our culture will hear this truth and they will celebrate that God has provided a way. When we were lost, when we were broken, God provided a way where there was no way. And we will celebrate that truth. And others will hear it and condemn. That to say, how dare anybody say that there is only one way? But I want to be clear, it's not that we're right and someone else is wrong. It's that God has declared what is true and we are submitted to that. We are saying, yes, I am broken and I am submitted to this truth. And I invite you to submit to God, to the path that He has provided for us. Join me in our submission to Christ. We don't stand in arrogance and say that we're so intelligent. We have this all figured out. It is by the mercy of God that we say God has provided a way. Join me. Come alongside. There is only one name by which we may be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And here's the amazing truth. This is point number five. That credentials aren't required to make an eternal impact, right? Like you don't have to have some special training to proclaim this glorious truth or to invite others in and say, let's submit to Christ together. Because look at what it says in verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, this wasn't Peter saying, oh man, I'm really being bold here, right? This is the religious leader saying, really? You just said that to us. We are the political figures. We are the ones in charge. We are the high priestly family. We're the ones who guard the holy of holies. And we're the ones who manage the sacrificial system. You're a fisherman from Galilee. You're common. We're aristocrats. And yet you're going to speak with this kind of boldness? And they're taken back by this. And then they perceive that They've been with Jesus. Jesus has had an impact on them. He's changed them. He's given them a boldness and authority. They didn't like it, but they recognized it. And I wonder what that means then for us. Like, how would you describe yourself? Like, I'm just kind of an average Joe. Right? Like, nothing special. Doesn't have to be well spoken, no degree. Like, in part of the big idea of this passage, it's to understand that God is empowering the average disciple to proclaim the gospel to all peoples. And this is, is the hope that we have. That, that there's no excuse. Like I think of Moses when God was saying, hey, go, like be on mission. I'm sending you to the Pharaoh to release my people. And he's like, remember I get tongue-tied? Um, someone else might be better at this. Thank you. And God's like, no. Like We can make excuses why I, I'm not good enough, why I'm not smart enough, why I don't have enough training, why I don't, somebody else can do it. But part of what we're reminded of is that God chooses the weak and foolish things of the world to proclaim His glory. That in the same way that God uses hardships 
to allow his glory to shine, God also uses the weak things so that it is clear it's not because of you. Like, I don't know if I've told this story before, but I remember when I was a, uh, a youth pastor and working with students, and it was a Super Bowl Sunday, and we were doing this outreach event. And it was a lot of different churches that were coming together for this event, and they had one of the other uh, youth pastors, it was actually one of the youth helpers, present the gospel during halftime. And it was terrible. I mean, the guy was so nervous, and he was stumbling over it, and he's just like, you're kind of like looking at your watch and saying, really? Like, couldn't we have found someone, a better communicator? And, and I'm sitting there, and th- this is kind of how I'm evaluating how everything's going. That was my heart at the time. And then he asked, like, did people want to trust in Jesus? And numerous students responded. And I was like, I'm an idiot. (laughs) Like, just a complete fool that I thought it had anything to do with how well the communication was, what kind of stories are told or illustrations or how good of a communicator. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I was put in my place and rightfully so. That's the reality. Like, you don't have to say, well, how well am I going to say it? Am I going to get everything right? Am I going to have just the right words or convince them? It's not about that. It's about your faithfulness to trust in God. And it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the hope. That's why it's like, I can just be an average guy. I can be myself and share this glorious truth. And that leads us to the final point, that we're free to trust God with the results of our evangelism. I see this in the text as we go through because Peter presented the gospel to a multitude and thousands of people came to Christ. He preaches nearly the exact same message and they want to kill him. Right? This isn't about Peter This isn't about how well he communicated. Like, oh, wow, he must have preached really well in front of the crowds, but put him in a a house under some pressure and he fumbled over his words. That didn't have anything to do with it. Like, it gives a hope and a response that God is the one in charge. We are faithful to proclaim and God is the one who works. One of my favorite passages is coming up next week. Um, Hilton's going to be preaching, super excited to have him share next week. But one of my favorite passages is verses 28 and 29. And I've found myself praying this often as we've traveled around the world and had the opportunity to share. And it was asking God in response to these threats, they went back, they prayed and they're like, God, give us boldness to proclaim your truth, to proclaim the gospel while you Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform miracles and signs and wonders. And so this is what I find myself praying, that God is sovereign. Lord, give us uh, the boldness to share. And I'm going to trust you with the results. You heal. You restore. You perform miracles and wonders as you see fit. And give us the words. Give us the heart of a lion the passion and the desire that all people might know. That God is at work all around us. In in the lives of your family, your co-workers, your neighbors. That the challenges that you're facing personally today in this moment might be the very opportunities God wants to use to allow His glory to shine through your life as you trust in Him. And this might be a testimony for others that you don't just pray for relief, but you pray for strength. A supernatural strength. And I pray that you feel the the opportunity and the responsibility that you don't need to have a special title a special training to be a faithful disciple who follows, who proclaims. 
And, and that when I talk about sharing again, I want to say that it's not just about evangelism. That sometimes when we think about, I want to become a disciple who's making a disciple. This is, is the life we're called into. But that isn't just in evangelism, but it's in that journey of discipleship with one another in community. How are we spurring one another on? How are we helping people grow? How are the older reaching out to the younger? Like, how are we moving through this journey together that we are becoming together? Discipleship is not just from the moment of unbelief to belief. Discipleship is the journey throughout life to follow Christ, to be transformed by Him continually. It's that entire journey until the day we see God face to face. And there will be no more tears and we will be glorified and made perfect. Until then, we are disciples. We are becoming. And we are encouraging one another in that journey. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I thank You that You are at work around us. I thank You that that You have chosen to place Your Spirit within each and every believer. And I thank You that You're not just there and silent and inactive, but Lord, that You are active. You are working in and through us. And I pray that when fear seizes us, that we would trust in You that You would give us the words, that You would give us the actions, that, Lord, maybe we're scared of what people would think, what people might say, but, Lord, give us a boldness to be faithful to You, to trust in You. And, Lord, I pray that You would glorify Yourself Lord, in and through the people represented here and those who couldn't be here this morning, Lord, that You would bring glory to Christ through our witness, through our words. Lord, give us a boldness to proclaim the glory of Jesus Christ and salvation in His name alone. And Lord, I pray that You would stretch out Your hand and heal and save. I pray that You would perform miracles and heal. Lord, would You work? Would You transform us for Your glory? And in Jesus' name, Amen. Please stand and join with me as we continue in worship.